Um, I think the theme that you've come up with for, for, for today is, is really, really interesting one from all kinds of directions and I see the way that the day is going to pan out and, and change engages with so many different aspects of that. I do think the aspects of sort of engaging with the so-called austerity uh, measures, the destruction of um, uh, public funding sectors and so on is incredibly important and something that I feel very uh, passionate about um, and I'm exploring in other aspects of work. But um, this morning uh, I thought I would actually use the theme uh, to, to talk a little bit about my sight writing practice because it made me realise that actually generative constraints is very much something that I've been working with um, and that will, I think, come out through, through my talk. Um, I'm actually going to give a, a, spoken, a spoken paper coming out of the text. I hope that's okay. I think the way the day will pan out, this will be probably the most formal and normative of all the presentations here, so apologise in, in advance for that. So... Um, <coughs> I think really what I want to think about is how um, in the sight writing practice that I've been working on, how the physical object of criticism might set the terms of constraint for formally and conceptually for different forms of writing to be generated. Sight writing is a term which is sort of my way of what I've been uh, thinking of as practicing the situatedness of criticism and a way of attempting to interpret the object whatever the object might be, and I'll come back to that. And to try and perform this interpretation for and to another uh, through the act of remaking an artefact in words. Such a project involves engaging quite strongly with the terms of criticism, specifically terms such as judgment, discrimination, and critical distance from a spatial perspective. One where space might be material and architectural, rather than solely metaphorical. And I'm interested in how criticism as a practice can investigate with the spatial and often changing positions we occupy as critics, materially, conceptually, emotionally, and uh, ideologically. When the art critic Hal Foster discusses the need to rethink critical distance, he points to the different distances produced by the optical and the tactile, but warns of the dangers of what he calls both disidentification and over-identification with the object of study. Foster rejects those who lament the end of true criticality, as well as those who see critical distance as a form of what he calls instrumental mastery in disguise. However, despite advocating the need to think through questions of critical distance, Foster still proposes that the critic's role is to judge and make decisions without fully examining how these modes of operation might be spatially conditioned. Also drawing attention to critical distance, but in response this time to literary works, Isabel Armstrong has closely examined the differences between what she calls close and distant reading. Armstrong distinguishes between a criticism of affect and one of analysis, but rejects the tendency to use a binary model to divide feeling and thought. Instead, she calls for affect to be included within rational analysis and writes, the task of a new definition of close reading is to rethink the power of affect, feeling and emotion in a cognitive space. The power of affect needs to be included within a definition of thought and knowledge rather than theorised as outside them, excluded from the rational. Using, again, highly spatialised language, Armstrong argues that it's the feeling-thought binary which itself installs a form of critique, where the subject is located in a position of power over the text, as other, producing a form of distant rather than close reading. She states that this form of reading rests upon an account of a text as outside, something external which has to be grasped or warded off. By trying to reposition the artwork as a site, it's my intention to investigate the spatiality of a critic's relation to a work by trying to adopt and adapt Howard Cagle's notion of strategic critique, where a position of judgment is advanced through the process of criticising itself, as well as paralleling Gavin Butt's important work and his call for the recognition of an imminent rather than a transcendent mode of contemporary criticality which is apprehended within, so he says, an instance as the performative act of critical engagement itself. 
Critics from performance and feminist studies, I'm sure many in the room are very familiar with this, coming from the areas that you do, have also expressed an interest in the performative qualities of criticism. So I think probably coming out of uh, people who have been working within live art, theatre, performance, this would be incredibly familiar. Uh, for me, coming from architecture through into art criticism, this was actually quite a revelation for me, the idea of performance writing, as, as some people know very well in the audience today. So Amelia Jones and Andrew Stevenson, for example, take issue with the tradition that the interpreter must be neutral or disinterested in the objects which he or she judges. They posit instead that the processes of viewing, interpreting, involve what they call entanglement in an intersubjective space of desire, projection and identification. Interpretation, they argue, like the production of works of art, is a mode of communication. Meaning is a process of engagement and never dwells in one place. This process of engagement involves perhaps finding a voice in criticism, one that might be discovered in relation to the object, one that could be a close-up, could be a glance, could be a caress, could be an accidental brush, could draw on spaces as they're remembered and imagined, as they're dreamed, as well as how they're actually observed, in order to try and position and reposition the critic and the reader in relation to one another in response to a work, and in so doing try to challenge criticism as a form of knowledge with a singular and static point of view located only in the here and now. So in a way that's a, a very kind of very, very condensed um, summary of really what happened in the work that I was doing, which I'll get onto the actual work itself if you like, although this is clearly part of it, um, was something that came through experimentation and then I started to realise that what I was doing actually locked into a number of other things that other um, critics and theorists have been looking at and for me the, the practice of acknowledgement, of making sure that one's work is always acknowledging those who are working in a similar way is a very important one, this kind of mapping out of a terrain in some ways. I've been very interested in exploring the use of prepositions in order to investigate how variations in position and voice could shift the relation between the so-called critic and her so-called object of study from one of mastery, the object under critique, distance, writing about an object, to one of relation and dialogue, writing to the object and perhaps also equivalent, writing as the object. In fact, it's the writing as the object that I've become more and more interested in. Analogy, the desire to invent a writing that is somehow like the artwork, allows a certain creativity to intervene in the critical act as the critic comes to understand and interpret the work by remaking it through a different medium. Words, perhaps, or could be, actually, in other, in other forms too, but somehow on his or her own terms. And something that I've not looked at enough, but I'm also fascinated by, is the Greek practice of expressis, which some people here may be familiar with, the art of describing a visual work of art, which is both a kind of rhetorical act, a graphic act, also a dramatic exercise. And interestingly, the word comes from the Greek ekphrasis, speaking out or out and speak respectively. So perhaps this is precisely where constraint comes in. The object offers a set of constraints which I use to determine where and how the writing might go. How does one decide to make an object, to remake an object in words? Which things will come into focus, which will fade into the background, which get accepted, applauded, which are challenged, which are questioned, perhaps rejected, and which may not even have been noticed. In my mind, this idea of remaking or perhaps practicing the object tends towards activities of use, what does it mean to use an object, a concept, an artwork, even an artist, rather than to relate to one? In his 1968 paper, The Use of an Object, the psychoanalyst D.W. Uh, Winnicott describes how relating may be to a subjective object, but usage implies that the object is part of external reality. For Winnicott, to use an object is to take into account its objective reality or existence as a thing in itself, rather than its subjective reality or existence as a projection. 
The change from relating to using for him is significant. It means that the subject destroys the object, that the object comes to stand not inside as an internal object, but outside the omnipotent control of the subject, recognised, as he says, as the external object it has always been. What's interesting about Winnicott's observation is that the shift from the object to the subjective object occurs through its use, and that this is precisely spatial. The object ends up in a different place, outside, not inside. Reflecting on this, I've been wondering whether my impulse to write artworks is a form of use, and if so, whether then sight writing goes some way to engage with how critics might use rather than view artworks and how using art might be rather different from viewing art, since it might engage specifically with the work as a formal and not only conceptual constraint, and perhaps following architecture and use, then deal with function and program and so on. To use rather than view art might seem rather a strange position for a critic to adopt, given the optical terms of visual culture, but for me it seems a much more appropriate way to approach the spatial concerns of architectural discourse and also the more functional creative practice of design, which is always in response to a need filtered through a brief or a set of programmatic requirements or constraints, as well as physical settings and parameters. In design, the physical constraint is precisely the generator of creativity. And I think for me, this, this sort of um, issue about um, creativity in design coming out of engagement with constraint is precisely, I think, what has been fueling or informing the, the site writing work that I've been doing. Because I think the early training that I had as an architect, the work that I still do in teaching architecture, is always working to identify constraints and often then to kind of critique constraints or rearrange constraints in a way that one can work um, productively with them. So I think this is very much a sort of backstory for me in the way that I've been thinking about my practice. I think it's quite difficult. I don't know what other people in the room would say about this. Perhaps we can discuss it. It's quite difficult to overturn the constraint of one's sort of early uh, training, professional, practice, um, academic. And I think that can be, for me, it's been incredibly productive. As architecture has a very strong uh, professional training that can be very... Um, comforting, um, but it can also be very alienating and there's a lot of people who come back to architecture after many years in professional practice to do our PhD programme, uh, design PhD programme, practice-led research, which is precisely to kind of um, use the constraints of the profession to generate a different way of practising architecture. So I think there's sort of that in the background here too. So I'm just going to um, present a couple of pieces of sight writing. Um, we'll see how we go on time. I don't want to overrun, which is always the danger. Um, what time do we want to finish this session? We started about 20 minutes late. Yeah. So we should, we should, I think, give you your time and, and end here at 10.45. OK, We've that's got plenty perfect. Of time. Yeah, well, that's fine. OK, great, thank you. So um, I'd like to turn then and uh, present um, present a small extract from a piece, a longer essay called To Miss the Desert, that was written in relation to Nathan Coley's artwork called Black Tent from 2003, um, which was curated by uh, Gavin Wade um, for a program called Art and Sacred Spaces. Around the edge, the bathroom has a floor of polished marble, black interwoven with white veins. Perched on the toilet with her feet dangling off the ground, she traces the white lines with her gaze. She keeps alert for cockroaches. At any time, one might crawl through the cracks around the edge of the room and into the blackness. 14 floor finishes, location G6. Lay new flooring, 300 mil by 300 mil, terracotta, unglazed tiles with sandstone colour grout, 10 mil wide joints. All tiles to be laid out from centre line, finished floor level to match G5. All the floors are marble, smooth and cool, laid out in careful grids, except for the big golden rug next to the sofa. She likes to follow its intricate patterns with her feet like paths around a secret garden. 
But if you dance around the edge of the squares, you mustn't be silly enough to fall in. Who knows what could lie in wait for you in an enchanted garden. Along the edge of her garden are a number of small rooms. These are home to Gullum and Kareem. Gullum is tall and fair-skinned, with light hair, green eyes. Kareem is shorter, darker hair, skin and eyes. They fought each other in the past and they'll fight again when the Soviets come to Kabul and then again when her own people search the Hindu Kush to wipe out all evil. But for now there is no fighting. Once the sun has gone down, they sit and eat together. He's a man with property and wives. Inside the walls of his house are sunlit orchards with trees full of dark purple fruit. A group of women dressed in different shades of red watch them arrive. Some have covered their faces, but she can still see pink nail varnish on their toes, and as her family draws closer, the women disappear. 14 floor finishes, location 1.5 and G5. Four bone end, lino sheeting, 1.5 mil to be laid on 6 mil WBP ply subfloor. Ply and lino to run under appliances around kitchen units. Color TBA by client. Aluminium threshold at junction with G2, G6 and 1.1. They sit upstairs in a long veranda overlooking the garden. The only furniture is a carpet laid out in a line down the middle of the room. Important men from the village, all in turbans, sit cross-legged around the edges of the carpet and eat from the dishes laid out between them. Her mother, her sister and herself are the only women. And as they walk back down through the dark house to leave, she sees a pair of eyes watching her from behind a screen. The eyes belong to a girl, a girl with the hands of a woman, a woman who glints with silver. Later she learns that this is Corrine's youngest wife, once a nomad who carries her wealth and the jewels on her fingers. So that's a, an extract out of a much, uh, much longer piece, but um, I just read it to give you a kind of flavour of the work, and I just want to say something now about perhaps how it operates around the idea of generative constraint. So the, the, the artwork, if you like, uh, Black Tent, had developed out of Nathan Coley's interest in religious structures in general, but in particular, the evocative and, and very precise description of the construction of the tabernacle that's given in the Bible. And the curator, Gavin Wade, had read a piece of my writing where I asked whether it was possible to write architecture rather than write about architecture. And so he asked me to write a tabernacle. That was the, that was the constraint. Um, luckily, I felt that the text in the Bible was already a writing of the tabernacle, so that was a bit of um, generative moves on my part. And actually, I do. I mean, I do actually think that's the case. If any of you, I mean, I, you know, I'm not a religious person, but I do happen to know that part of the Bible, and it's the most amazing piece of writing and description of, of architecture. Um, and so I decided instead to set myself the constraint of writing black tent. And to ask myself, really for the first time, I think, in this piece, how could um, the architecture of the artwork operate as some kind of constraint for writing? And this, it, I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, retrospectively, it's very good to have these two terms, generative constraint, to work with. But this isn't a kind of overwriting of something else I was doing before. This actually was what I was trying to do, use the, the material and the conceptual aspects of the project as some kind of constraint. So, black tent consists of a flexible structure, as you can see, a number of steel-framed panels with black fabric screens stretched across them. Small coloured squares and transparent windows are crisscrossed with stitching and inserted into the screens. And the project black tent moved to a number of different sites in the town of Portsmouth, including two different sites in the cathedral. Um, I think the others were a park, um, a school and a shopping centre and it was reconfigured each time in a different location. So actually the piece of writing that I wrote sort of followed those five different configurations. The essay um, tried to echo aspects of black tent. So the differing configuration of the panels depending on their situation, but also the different spatial conditions involved, such as around the edge, and then some of the others are in the center, um, down the middle, I can't remember all of them now, but they're, they're to do with different spatial conditions. 
So my essay, like Coley's work, explores the nature of boundary conditions, which are both can be specific and uh, generic, political and personal, material, psychic, religious. Paralleling Coley's interest in the bounded site of the religious sanctuary, I also cho chose spatial motifs of sanctuary, but I actually specifically chose secular ones um, that came from the ideas of home and uh, refuge. The narrative um, is spatial, like the squares, it has sort of two sides, but of course what I came to realise later was actually the square has sort of four sides, but two fa it's actually two faces. I think faces might be a better <coughs> way to the way that this is constructed. So there are two voices that I try to pitch against one another to, to create a dynamic between a private and a public sanctuary. One uh, remembers a childhood spent in various nomadic cultures and countries in the Middle East, and the other adopts a more professional tone to describe various sanctuaries at different scales and stages of the design process. So these texts derive from construction specifications that I wrote when designing contemporary sanctuaries which were specifically a series of community buildings for different so-called minority groups. So what in a way was important to me was to use the formal constraint to generate aspects of the writing, but uh, the formal constraint of the artwork, but also for me I didn't, well I suppose what I'm trying to say is that in copying one also makes an act of uh, potentially critical interpretation. So I didn't want to um, follow through the religious aspects, the Judeo-Christian uh, ones that Coley had taken, but rather I was using domestic sites of sanctuary, but also looking back through my childhood, which had mainly been spent in, um, in Muslim cultures, I was thinking of kind of trying to destabilise this uh, religious tack that Coley, Coley had taken. Now, moving on from that, um, so sort of now moving away from responding directly to an artwork using the constraints that it might have produced, I decided to, which I often do, remake a piece of writing in relation to another physical site this time. So I transformed to, the, the essay called To Miss the Desert into another piece of work called An Embellishment Purger when it moved to a new site. So rather a long time ago now, um, in 2006, I was involved in a research uh, group called Spatial Imagination and Design. And um, one of the other collaborators is here, which is really nice, I'm surprised. Um, and we worked for a year uh, on a number of workshops and finally on an exhibition um, and a catalogue and a website at the Domobel Gallery in London. And the work that I produced, I'm not going to talk about the whole show, there were some amazing pieces, including fantastic work by Bridget McClear, who's here today, and some other really wonderful works, but I just want to focus for, 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 for the time that I have on the piece that I made, which was called An Embellishment Purder. So it was a two-part um, installation, don't worry about being able to read the text there, that's not, not a problem at the moment. Um, so what I did was I it selected extracts from the longer essay to Miss the Desert, 12 extracts from it, in response to the window in the gallery, which was a, a grid 3 by 3 by 4 um, And these uh, were laid out, these small narrative extracts, which mainly dealt with different inside-outside conditions of some sort um, in the, in the catalogue that went with the show. And then in the window of the gallery itself, um, I wrote in um, black eyeliner, black coal, uh, the word purder, which um, some of you, I imagine all of you know what that means. Um, and I'll, it means in, in uh, Persian, it means curtain. Um, and it describes the cultural practice of separating and hiding women through clothing, but also through architecture. So veils, screens, walls, uh, from the public male gaze. Now, for me, the reason that I chose the window to work on in the gallery was because I was so interested in different kinds of threshold conditions, windows and doors and so on. And this um, picture of me 
age two in Darfur in Sudan, standing at the threshold of the, of the house we lived in, was a sort of starting point, a constraint, if you like, an emotional constraint. But also this image that I found in a sort of family photo book of a window staring back at the house that uh, we lived in when we were living in Kabul um, in Afghanistan in the 70s. My dad's a hydrogeologist, a sort of water engineer, so we were there at, at, in the mid-70s, early 70s. And I thought it was really interesting. I didn't even realise that we had a picture of the house that we lived in, but being viewed from outside back into the house, but against this very strong um, configuration of the frame of the window. But also, um, in the piece that I read out, you, you heard the, the reference to rugs. And I've always been very interested in the patterns of rugs as sort of meditative devices, but also the way that they're often representations of gardens or architecture, whether kind of earthly or, or forms of sort of paradise garden. And also the fact that there, I discovered there are certain kinds of rugs in nomadic cultures that are also used as curtains. They're called enzi rugs. So they don't go on the floor. They're actually used as, as um, doors uh, between inside and outside of, um, of the tent. So what I was interested in was the possibilities of um, using the window using the window as a, as a sort of screening device, but particularly, and I'll just sort of describe that quite precisely, I imagined that for an embellishment purder, when the sun set, the writing would, like a rug, form a pattern on the gallery floor, where the viewer's shadow facing west, away from Mecca, so that's in the orientation of the, of the gallery, would be cast behind him or her. However, in January, the time of the year that the work was installed, the sun was too low in the sky to create the intended shadow. So other quite unexpected effects were produced, which resonated with the concerns of the piece. To perform the writing, I had to stand in the window with my face screened, occupying a position behind a veil that I hadn't imagined. And as night fell, the light from inside the gallery illuminated my body. And perhaps this was actually the most that was this was actually the most constraining aspect of the work. So this is I mean I haven't even planned to document the, the process of writing in Purda in the, the diary script in the window and I certainly hadn't thought about the physical endurance that that would take or the fact that the um, the sill was very, very uh, tight space and quite dangerous and um, very, very difficult to balance. So having to form this kind of calligraphy act and practice calligraphy, which I'd never done before, um, and sort of do this in a particular time frame and make it very precise was something that became of more interest to me um, during the piece and also what it meant to be illuminated from behind. Um, and I was very interested in this image um, who travels back to Afghanistan when her sister writes from Kandahar to say she's going to kill herself before the next solar eclipse. The female protagonist's journey is at times filmed from behind the veil she is wearing and in fact for those of you who've seen the film that's one of the most interesting things about it that it's filmed from behind the, the, the burqa. But um, when I tried to find a still from that, there weren't any. The main still, which is shown in the media of this film, is, the, is this image, um, which I think is quite interesting with the, the shadow of the, vet, of the embellished vet, um, eye screen, eye grill from the burqa falling over the eyes of the woman. But it's a very interesting film for those who haven't seen it because it kind of reverses this media representation of the camera imaging a faceless figure, which is what we normally see, covered in a burqa, and instead seeing the view out from behind the burqa, and, and in images like this, the face being uh, revealed. Um, I wasn't so interested in this piece of work on, on making a judgment about the veil. In fact, I'd been reading the work of Leila uh, Ahmed, and she talks about how um, the issue of Purda and the burqa 
and the whole um, kind of Western obsession with the uncovering of women is actually used as a tool for justifying different acts of colonialization. She's referring to Franz Fanon's work, but also at the time of making this work was the time around the um, attacks and invasion on Iraq and Afghanistan. And it was very interesting to read the media at that time and find that alongside a justification for why we must go to war and seek out bin Laden and all the rest of it, where there would always be an article about a woman living under terrible conditions in Afghanistan and how important it was to, to kind of save her from the Taliban. It's not that I necessarily agree with some of the, the practices of Purdue. I think they are very, very restrictive on women, but I think one has to be careful about one, where one is making a kind of judgment for it. So the, the kind of the final thing that I say about this work is, in the site writing book is, um, an embellishment Purdue does not make a judgment on the veil. Rather, it wishes to show how things might seem quite different depending on who and where you are. From inside the gallery and outside on the street, by day and by night, the work changes according to the position occupied, sometimes transparent to other times opaque, revealing then concealing. This embellishment or decorative covering invites the viewer to imagine beyond the places he or she can see. So in that statement, I'm describing the, the, the physicality and changing position of this particular piece, but also hinting there at um, the need for people to take into account their own positionality in, in judging the practice of the murder. Um, this work will probably go on into something else. I don't quite know exactly how it will manifest itself. The, pro the project that I did want to do, <coughs> but in the end, it all ran out of time was to remake this piece of work in a hotel window opposite the American Embassy because I thought it would actually be kind of a more positioned. I think the site of the gallery here was very, very helpful for me as someone who had not made a sort of text-based installation before. You know, it gave me scope as a space like this would do to experiment, which is fantastic and work out that I did need to actually check where the sun was coming from if I was going to make a work about a shadow. Not, not a bad idea, really. Um, but I think to think about where a work like this then might be positioned to have maximum effect is really important. So hopefully that's going to be a, ne a next step for this particular piece. How am I doing? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So this is going to be a much briefer, shorter description. An another example, I just think it's important to show two, two, two ways that one might work with this con material constraint of an artwork. So this is a very different kind of uh, project, which I'll, I'll only give a very kind of short overview of. Um, it's a, the, originally a piece called Longing for the Lightness of Spring. So Spring uh, is a piece of work by the artist Alina Brotheras. It was initially uh, commissioned by Jules Wright for the Wapping Project and was an installation composed of two pieces, a backlit image, untitled, showing a pale Icelandic sky over lava covered in moss, reflected in the water tank on the roof of Wapping. And then a piece called Rain, Oak Forest and Flood, which are in the boiler house at the diffused pump station, so in an internal space, dark space, uh, in the <coughs> bowels of this uh, disused pump station. A work that anticipates spring, spring opened in Wapping just after the autumn equinox in the Northern Hemisphere. And in response to Elena's spring, I wrote three short texts and inserted these into a longer critical essay. I'm not going to read the whole essay, I'm just going to read the short, uh, the short pieces that I inserted into it because it was probably, I think, the first time that I was using um, autobiography as a way of kind of intersecting with criticism. So this is a work that started prior to the, the one that I've just described. I tend to always have three or four projects on the go that keep getting remade and reconfigured, um, and, and these are two of them. So Moss Green, it's a beautiful house, a one-story building with a square plan, 
Born at the birth of modernism in the aftermath of the First World War, it embodies the values of early English modernism, of the arts and crafts movement, truth to materials and honest craftsmanship. From the road it looks a little unloved, in need of some care and attention. Up close it is clearly derelict, almost in ruins. We enter a room with windows at each end, curtains are falling away from the runners. The fabric has been soaked overnight and is drying in the spring afternoon sunshine. On the windowsill and spilling over onto the floor are piles of old magazines. The pages are stuck together and disintegrate if you pull them apart. There are some photographs of buildings. One is particularly damp. The corners are soft. The surface is wrinkled. It shows a tower block just completed, empty and pristine, a moss green utopia. The modernist screen dispersing as it soaks up spring rain. White linen. I dreamt of the house last night, my mother's house in Cungall, South Wales, a place where it always rained in the holidays. But as a girl I resented, but now as it's being taken away from me, I already begin to miss. I was in the dining room. The rest of the house was empty except this one room. The furniture was far too big and covered in linen. The air was thick and still, silent. With the curtains drawn it was very dark, but the linen glowed white. I went towards the mantelpiece to take a look at myself in the mirror and I saw for the first time in the reflection that the room was full of plants so alive I could smell moisture still on their leaves. Bittersweet. In Palafrugel, a small town north of Barcelona on the Costa Brava, is a derelict cork factory with a clock tower in front. The clock tower is a handsome structure, elegant and robust, but the clock on top has stopped. The floor is covered in dust and pieces of furniture, lampstands, chairs, old printing machinery. There are words everywhere, scattered all over the floor. <coughs> Burnt orange, turquoise, black and white, bittersweet. We stay in the factory a long time. We don't speak, just walk and look. And later, once we've left the building, he brings something to show me. It's a white sign with carefully painted black letters, bittersweet. I reach into my bag and pull out a clear perspex rod. Along one side of it, letters printed onto the cardboard are embedded. From the top it's out of focus, but from the side you can read it. Bittersweet. So um, what I was trying to do with the three texts was make these spatial and visual associations with Brotheress's work. Obviously, most obviously, her structure of the triptych, um, but also the textures of lava and moss. Um, and the colour palette, perhaps, of monochrome and pastel. So that's a very kind of formal correspondence coming out of the kind of constraint of the forms uh, and the materials that she uses. But there are also interests for me in temporal correspondence. So Moss Green describes a derelict house in the Green Belt, where in spring, in early March, we found photographs of a brave new world of modernist high-rise housing. So a sort of beginning being found in an ending somehow. Just after the autumn equinox, just after her death, I dreamt of the home of my Welsh great aunt. White linen recalls this dream. And again, there's the, 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 the plants in the dream, these, these kind of fresh spring-like plants in this um, room, which is very much like a kind of more or scene, scene of death in some way. And then bittersweet remembers another visit, this time another spring visit, uh, to an abandoned pork factory in Catalonia where we found the names of colours scattered all over the floor. So I was very interested here in juxtaposing these two different flows of time. One is the resurgence of spring and the decay of autumn, so these two working against one another, but also my own fascination with the backwards gaze of nostalgia in relation to Brotherus's interest, which is more in anticipation as a longing that moves forward rather than backwards. And in both, I won't go on and describe them here because I wanted to end with a different kind of piece, but um, these have all ended up in forming kind of new projects, a whole project more recently that I've done um, called Coming to Welsh about going back to Wales and, and with a project with covering things with white linen. And then in, the, in this house, Moss Green, with the photos that were found of the 1950s, new public housing built under the LCC, 
that's become a whole new project, which is about the um, current demolition of the public realm and the way that social housing, some of you who may be following some of this in the press, in some of the very key regeneration schemes, Haygate most strongly in South London, but in many other parts of London, the removal of social housing and its replacement with so-called affordable housing. So it's a theme that I think is very current for many people, what's happened to the so-called modernist dream or what's happened to the welfare state. There are lots of very, very interesting debates around that because, of course, the welfare state was set up by a Liberal government and um, after the war kind of managed, if you like, by a, a Tory one. So what we think of as welfare seems incredibly benign to the current condition, but actually it wasn't particularly revolutionary in its um, starting point, but it did allow for um, a kind of generosity of spirit that we certainly don't see now. So that, that's become a whole, a whole new project and a tracing a whole, a whole route of this architectural design and social housing back to the Russian avant-garde. Very uh, following some similar attacks to Owen Hathaway's work, actually, but with a, a different, much more um, uh, poetic rather than directly political narrative. But I'm just going to end with a, a very recent piece. Um, in fact, I was just saying to Nick, I'm not quite sure what the title should be anyway. This is the working title for today For and Talentire from In With 2013. Gridlock. Why? A window, a balcony. A window, a window, a window, a window, a balcony, a window, a wind. A window, a balcony, a window, a window, a window, a window, a balcony, a window, a win. A window, a balcony, a window, a window, a window, a window, a balcony, a window. A window, a balcony, a window, a window, a window, a window, a balcony, a window. Window. Balcony, a window, a window, a window, a window, a balcony, a wind. Indo, a balcony, a window, a window, a window, a window, a balcony, a win. A wall, a window, a lamppost, a man, a pram, a phone box, a wall, a window, a door, a window, a bollard, a wall, a window, a tree, a bollard, a man, a door, a bollard, a window, a bollard, a wall, a man. A tree, a window, a door, a window, a wall, a... a blind spot. From the top, two windows, no view in, reflections in one, of the sky, obliquely. Below this, two windows, no view in, reflections in both, of the windows, opposite. Below this, two windows, no view in, no reflections of the sky, of the windows, outside. Instead of glass, a layer of tiny mosaic tiles has been inserted on top of what might be a concrete render. Like the scales of an old amphibian, they would like to shimmer in the sun. About to touch. Something a little bit sexy. The surface is of brick, but as thin as a sliver of inserted into the otherwise skin. It serves as a cover for another, most orthogonal urban grid, one side of lightly concrete framed structure. Smooth glass scoops out a passage of pristine and precise. It's hard to invitation through the rotating door. No, if it is just old or just pretending slipping around the shiny surface, to be so. When the brick facade stops, moving against a torx curve, it's replaced by a plane of glass, which seems pressing forward until the, to have been revealed by peeling back the brick, skin, two are about to touch. Up close, it's clear that the two are not overlaid, but abutted. Inversion. This looks the wrong way up. The two sides slope down towards each other where they meet, water gathers, lingers here at length, water flows down, not up. Mm. 
The National Women's Council of Ireland is delighted to present Still We Work, an exhibition featuring artists Sarah Brown, Vagabond Reviews, Miriam O'Connor and Anne Talentire. The exhibition has been devised as part of NWCI's legacy project developed by the curator Valerie Connor to mark their 40th anniversary and is funded by Atlantic Philanthropies. The artists were asked to reflect on the contemporary representations of women's work in the context of the centenary of the 1913 Dublin lockout. They've responded by making new works addressing women's experience of precarious contemporary working conditions and the invisibility of much of women's work. From In and With by Anne Talentire consists of 24 etched wood panels and 24 C-type photographs in a contained box. These correspond to 24 specially commissioned 100-word texts in the exhibition by women working in architecture, Ruth Morrow, Jane Rendell, Graham Hassett, Ellen Rowley, Culture Struction and Alice, Alice Casey. They describe photographs, we are never shown, of buildings located between the NWCI offices and the site of Jacob's Biscuit Factory in 1913, where locked out women remained on strike the longest. See www.galleryofphotography, i.e. 2013-1002, still we work. In response to the four photographs of Dublin that Anne Talentire sent me, I wrote four concrete, I don't know what they are. I called them poems, but then I felt a little bit nervous knowing the context, so perhaps they're not poems, they're just four. <laughs> um, Gridlock, blind spot, about to touch an inversion for Anne. For Anne's work, from, in, and with 2013. I sent these to Anne with four instructions for typesetting. In response to the four constraints issued by Anne for Jane, in the form of photographs, Jane generated four instructions for Anne for typesetting in the form of words. These words will be read out tonight at the centre for creative collaboration. These words are instructions for making images out of words we are never shown. So I'll just show you how they exist in Anne's work. So that's the first one, good luck. And then blind spot. <coughs> and then about to touch, which is always tricky to know how to read across or down go either way, and then um, inversion. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'll end there. Thank you. We'd like to open it up to questions. Um, we'll, we'll have a brief question session now, and I <coughs> we'll hope to so continue the conversation during the breaks and uh, lunch and the wine reception at the end of the day. So, um, uh, but anything now, please go ahead. Um, Jane, when you were talking about the embellishment part of this, mm. and you were talking about the actual performance of the writing mm -hmm. being precarious and precise, mm -hmm. um, and, and when you use those two words, uh, the first thing I was wondering, which isn't my question, but yeah. is whether there is a link between those etymologically. Um, but the second question is whether or not precariousness and precision might be a way of thinking about your writing, um, not just the act of it in that moment. Mm -hmm. And if so, whether you could embellish that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think they're great words. I hadn't thought of them together like that. It's really nice to think of them together. Yeah, precision is very important. I'll start with that one, because I think precision is important. Um, and finding a way of being precise that somehow also allows for ambiguity has become increasingly important. But also um, ambiguity without confusion. So it's somehow, and I'm sure it's to do with this very specific, again, architectural training, which is very much about precision, of trying to then um, be precise about a certain kind of ambiguity or to think in different projects where where the precision could lie, where could the precision be. Um, and for me it's often important that it's in the form of um, 
a political critique often, mm -hmm. but also in this, I, I just become very interested because of its kind of imaginative production of being precise to the form of the other work. So that's some, somehow, maybe even if I'm critiquing the, um, the content of the other work, there's somehow this sort of respect in the precision somehow. But in, in the precariousness, I think it's in the precariousness of the practice itself somehow. So to begin with, I wasn't even sure that I was what I what kind of writing I was doing, and I'm not so sure if it hadn't been for a publisher really encouraging me to be seen as criticism, I would have just thought of it as writing. So I think it's quite precarious often as criticism. It maybe weirdly becomes less so the more that it gets repeated, and also for me, what's really really exciting at the moment are the whole amounts of different kinds of practice that are occurring through actually often coming through um, younger academics you know and practitioners and uh, PhD students who are not so concerned with maybe barriers between different disciplines but actually in a, in a way quite um, open to, to trying things out whereas for me I felt that some of the work to begin with was quite precarious and also perhaps when you feel that you're entering, I know this is maybe where you were going because I think you were thinking more about embodiment, but I would say it's also the experience of um, kind of presenting a work where you don't quite know what it is. So, for example, in this last piece, it's the first time that I've presented it, and it's very um, the precariousness of it for me is I'm not quite sure where Anne ends and where I begin because it was commissioned to be inside Anne's work. Um, and I think she wanted me to actually describe the building's history, but I was keen on pulling it back in a different way. So that's a kind of precariousness. And also then presenting it, you know, if I present it to architects as a way of, of freeing them up to think differently about writing about the sites they're designing on, that isn't very precarious. It's kind of fu funny, fun, you know. But it, to present it to poets is a very, very, you know, and I'm sitting there, poet, artist, poet, um, and I'm sure many, 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 many other poets in the room, I wonder, poet, um, whether, whether it is poetry or what it means to call it that. So it's precariousness in that way. It's kind of generative, but you also feel the constraints of different bodies of disciplinary knowledge knocking up against it somehow. And to kind of hold that is not just an intellectual precariousness, but it's also a kind of emotional embodied experience too yeah go ahead <coughs> yeah i'm wondering um in the first sight writing piece that you spoke mm -hmm. about black tent it was very obvious to me to make the connection to a burqa but you pointedly didn't yeah and i'm wondering if you could explain to us why you chose not to because I'm assuming it was a choice on your part not to. What in the very first part? The black, the black tent piece. Um, yeah. When you were describing it, I don't think I actually heard you mention the word burqa no. at all or make that connection. It wasn't in I my think, mind. It wasn't in your no. mind. Oh, okay. No, not at all. Till I remade it as an embellishment perder. I see. Yeah. No, I realised it was latent, so I wrote it in a um, very sort of strange condition actually where I just had a, a hospital operation um, which had involved sort of this area um, and somehow all these memories I mean in a way it's not that odd when you think about it but it brought back a lot of childhood memories I had rabies injections around my stomach when I was a kid and that was the starting kind of memory for when I thought of the word around the centre I knew I wanted it to be childhood experiences of kind of comfort and potential danger, threshold conditions of some sort from my childhood, because I really wanted to use that to, to unbalance Nathan's piece, but then to use these different conditions. So when I thought of around the centre, that was the first one, around my, my sort of stomach, and then it kind of spread out. But I never really thought about Perda mm -hmm. until I came back to it much, much later. And that, well, not much, much later, several years later, I thought, oh, this would be interesting to work against the window in Domo Bal. Then I started to think, oh, well, of course, you know, windows, coverings, screens, heard it. And that's why I wanted to work with that concept then. So I think quite often in lots of work, there are these kind of latent, that's what, why I like going back to work. 
because I think there's often latent concepts that you haven't quite dealt with and there's sort of more to come out or at a different point in life or a different constraint or different uh, condition will produce a different way of um, turning the work somehow, turn it in a different direction, see something else in it that you missed. That's, and for me, because the context at that time was the um, very, I was thinking a lot about Afghanistan and Iraq and all of that, then it just seemed like that had to be what I wanted to work with. 